Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. It took a divorce and a three-year-old child to pull the blindfold off my eyes and make me face what I really knew had been there for a while. I hadn't wanted to see it. I'd ignored it as long as I could but suddenly, I was right up against it. The funeral was for my maternal grandfather, who died of a massive heart attack, and the three-year-old was my daughter Alyssa. We were at my mother's house the day after the funeral, making ready to leave and return home. The luggage was all packed and loaded into the rear of the navigator, and I was putting Alyssa in her car seat. Would you like your shoes off, honey? I asked her. I knew the answer, but I liked asking, because she would reply, and I loved the sound of her little girl's voice. Yes, please, she said solemnly and very distinctly. I smiled at her and began to unbuckle the straps on the tiny Mary Jane shoes. I didn't bother to ask if she would like her socks on or off. The answer was always off. That had to have been from my side of the family. I'd rather go barefoot myself than deal with hot, uncomfortable leather. With her socks off and her toes wriggling in undisguised relief, I tickled the soles of her feet. She knew I would and had been watching me intently, waiting for the moment she could squeal and kick her feet as if she actually wanted to get her away from my tickling fingers. She didn't, though. She'd have been unhappy if I hadn't done it. This was a game we often played, and one we'd both come to cherish. It struck me that we'd been playing it a lot lately. My young daughter and I were spending more and more time together. Both of us seemed to cherish the hours we had in each other's company. It was not so with my wife, Laura, though. Before I could explore that thought, my angelic little daughter interrupted my thoughts. Daddy? Alyssa asked. I was leaning past her and placing her shoes on the bench seat beside her. I stuffed each sock carefully inside the proper shoe and pushed the shoes a little into the cushion so they'd stay there. What, pumpkin? I asked gently. When she didn't immediately answer, I turned to look her in the eyes. Why doesn't mommy love us anymore? She asked simply. I was taken aback. I stared at my child for a moment, unable to answer. Honey, your mommy loves us both, I'm sure. I said slowly, and in particular, she loves you more than anything else in the whole, wide world. I assured her. For a brief instant, there was a sparkle in her eyes, but then it faded. But she didn't want to come with us to say goodbye to Grandpa, she said plaintively. I had no real answer except the one Laura had given me. She had to work, honey, I said. I was going to explain about the biggest account in the accounting firm my wife worked for and how it needed so much of her time and attention, but that would have raised far too many questions in a three-year-old's mind. I was quiet for a long moment. Mommy will be there when you get home, baby, I said consolingly. She'll be there waiting for you. Does she have to work at night? Too? Alyssa asked. I started to answer, saying no. Her mother went out at night with the girls, a lot to unwind. But again, that would have raised more questions than it answered in Alyssa's mind. No, baby girl, I said. I think mommy's about done with having to work so hard, and then she'll have lots more time to spend with you. And me, I told her. Suddenly, I had to end this conversation. It was too uncomfortable. I buckled the last strap on the car seat, kissed my little cherub of a daughter, and patted her arm before closing the door. Twenty minutes later, she was peacefully asleep in the rear seat while I drove the big SUV down the interstate. My daughter slept, but I could not. I kept replaying her sad words in my mind. If a three-year-old was noticing, it wasn't just me anymore. That was what my wife had implied the last time I'd asked why she was going out with her friends so often. The sun had nearly set when we pulled in the driveway. My wife, Laura, was indeed home. Alyssa ran upstairs, excited and bursting with things she wanted to tell her mother about all the cousins she'd encountered at my mom and dad's. I tailed along behind, still consumed with the dark thoughts that had taken root in my mind on the drive home. Why was my wife spending so much of her time in the office or partying with her girlfriends? I found Laura sitting before her vanity, putting on makeup in her bra and panties. She rose to give me a peck on the cheek and welcome. Without warning, the idea struck me that I couldn't remember the last time she'd given me a strong, lusty kiss and wrapped her arms around my neck to show me how much she loved me. I sat down on our bed and watched. Alyssa talked to her for a while, without much of a reply from her mother. It was obvious even to little Alyssa that Laura wasn't paying any attention and, after a while, our daughter wound down and quietly went down the hall to her own room. Laura continued primping, touching her hair and getting her makeup on exactly right. What's going on, Laura? I asked, trying to keep the unexpected emotion out of my voice. My stomach muscles were abruptly cramping, and I could feel the surge of blood up the back of my neck. It was difficult to breath. What do you mean, honey? She replied. 
She hadn't noticed my sudden agitation and was still giving all her attention to the mascara brush so near to her right eye. We've only been home ten minutes, I said brusquely, and you're rushing off somewhere already? She stopped brushing at her eyelashes and looked at me with poorly concealed impatience. Honey, you know I always go out with the girls on Friday nights, she said in a tired, weavy egon over this before, voice. I didn't like her tone and I didn't like the implication that she was doing something we'd agreed was right and proper. Actually, my dear, I said sarcastically, you go out with the girls on Saturday nights, some Sundays, almost every Wednesday, and virtually every Friday after work for happy hour, and sometimes they all blend into one long, excruciating night out for you. Alyssa had quietly disappeared after her mother had shut her out and was in her room with the door shut. I heard the strains of one of her educational toys starting to play a jingle. Getting up, I closed the bedroom door and turned back to find Laura also standing and looking at me without any expression on her face. Moving fast, I stepped close to her and caught up both her hands in mine. I hugged them to my chest. Laura, I said slowly, striving to keep control of my voice. I didn't want it to break right now. Honey, Alyssa asked me this afternoon why you didn't love us anymore. And Laura, I have to ask the same question, I guess. Laura's eyes narrowed in that way that told me I'd trespassed into forbidden territory. I ignored the signs and plowed ahead. Do you? Do you still love me? I asked my wife of six years. For a moment, she didn't answer. Then she fought off a visible irritation and melted against me. Of course, darling, she said softly, I love you more today than when we got married. And I thought I'd die sometimes. I was so happy. My stomach was still cramping, but I tried to relax. She was happy? But not now? Then stay home tonight, honey, I said, ignoring my sudden misgivings. I refused to let a begging note come into my voice. Laura sighed patting me and stroking my chest. We can put Alyssa to bed early, I said. We'll dim the lights and bring up that bottle of wine we've been saving, and you can put on that black lace camisole I bought you for Valentine's Day. How about that? Curiously, her body had seemed to be reacting in favor of my idea, until I mentioned the camisole. When I said that word, her body stiffened and she tried to back away. I held her by the wrists and wouldn't let her retreat far. Laura, I said deliberately, are you cheating on me? I watched her closely as I spoke and, there it was. I saw a quick flicker deep in her eyes and a minuscule tightening at the corner of her eyes. They were gone, they vanished quicker than it takes to tell, but I'd seen them. I heard a sharp hiss as she drew in a quick breath of air. What wasn't gone was a suddenly racing pulse I could feel through my fingertips. I'd kept her close to me by holding her wrists and the pads of my first two fingers were resting on the primary blood vessels there. It was as reliable a lie detector as any FBI polygraph. I had my answer. Don't be silly, my wife protested. Honey, I could never love any man but you. You know that, she said. She leaned into me, cuddling her head on my shoulder to breath softly into my neck and give me little kisses here and there. I noticed, though, her head didn't rest hard enough on my body to mess up her hairdo. I wondered if Laura felt the cold chill that was rippling up and down my back. Laura patted me on my upper arms and pulled away, turning to look at the clock beside the bed. I'm going to be late, she said, and I promised the gals I wouldn't be again. I gotta go, but maybe tomorrow night, she asked gently. Laura, we really need some us time, I answered, not trying very hard to disguise my rising annoyance. Tell the gals you'll make it some other time and spend tonight with me and our daughter. How about doing that for us, please? I suggested. She pulled away and went to her closet to pull on a short skirt. I can't disappoint all my friends, she protested. Why would you want me to do that? She said crossly. Why would you want to disappoint me and your daughter? I returned harshly. Or don't we matter any more to you? My wife's eyes narrowed as she worked herself into an anger to match mine. I told you tomorrow, she snapped. Damn it. I'm entitled to some time for myself without you always being there and smothering me to death. I'm not your goddamn slave, you know. We argued some more. She told me she was a free and independent member of this marriage, that I couldn't tell her what to do, and that she'd damn well do whatever she needed to do to get some relaxation and blow off some steam after a hard day's work. I said that she had always been given plenty of space. I said the proof of that was that she'd never heard a word of protest from me when she went back to work after the baby. I said I thought it was great she was working as a mid-level manager in an accounting firm when I actually made enough money for us to get along fabulously without her working at all. I told her I supported her career, was proud as hell of all that she had accomplished, but I didn't see why her job and nights out with the girls overrode the family's needs. 
I got a little sarcastic when I mentioned the girls, I guess. She got madder, asked what I was accusing her of, and then I left. I was too upset and too hot to keep going down that road. I'd have said something I might have later regretted, so I went downstairs to sit on the couch in the living room. I sat there fuming, with half an urge to physically stop her from going out on me this one night at least. But I knew, even through my rage, that I couldn't do that. When she came down the stairwell, I was reasonably calm. We looked at each other. She was defiant, and I, well, I don't know what I was feeling. It wasn't good, though. Laura, I said, please don't do this. My voice was unintentionally husky and deep. She stopped for a moment at the door as if in indecision, then she opened it. Laura, I said a little louder and more firmly. Honey, I love you. I'm begging you. Please don't do this to me and Alyssa. Laura looked back at me, her face totally devoid of any expression. Then she stepped through the door and closed it decisively behind her. Alyssa came running down the stairs and into the foyer. She opened the outside door and watched as the headlights of her mother's Lexus disappeared down the street. Without saying a word, she shut the door and walked quickly over to the couch. I knew that walk. It was as if the polished marble of the foyer floor was too hot to walk on and she had to get off it quickly. She clambered up on the couch near me and stared fixedly at the door for a while as if hoping her mother would miraculously come back in. I stared too. After a moment, Alyssa climbed onto my lap and we hugged for a long time before I carried her into the kitchen to make a couple of sandwiches for us. It was a frosty, uncomfortable weekend between Laura and me. She'd come home in the wee hours of the morning and spent most of Saturday with a hangover so bad the slightest noise caused her pain. After suffering Laura's short temper for a time, Alyssa and I bailed out and went to the park and we didn't come home until after dinner time. That didn't suit Laura very well at all. She lit into me when Alyssa and I got home, expressing her opinion, at length, of a husband and daughter who abandoned her. I took it for a while but quickly got fed up. I told her she'd brought it on herself by going out on me and abandoning her daughter the night before. I said she would have to get used to the idea that Alyssa and I spent this afternoon alone, and probably would again by ourselves, and we'd had a fantastic time. Deal with it the best way she could, I said. Whatever she did, I told her, without attempting to hide my irritation, deal with it civilly or shut the hell up. I'd never spoken to her that way, and it took Laura by surprise. The shock, if nothing else, kept her quiet and attentive to Alyssa for the rest of the evening. Detecting a thaw in her attitude later Saturday night, I initiated some tentative foreplay but Laura's stomach was still upset and we had to break off when she ran for the bathroom. I tried again Sunday night but Laura lay there like a log, completely unresponsive. Instead of continuing, I rolled away from her and lay there seething. After a while, I got up and went to take another shower, hoping the rushing water would soothe me and let me get some sleep. It was only marginally successful. Monday morning, I left the house before Laura got up. It was a thing I rarely did mostly because it forced Laura to get Alyssa up, dressed, fed, and off to daycare. My wife didn't like that. Unless she had everything all organized, it was a process guaranteeing she would be a half hour, or more, late to work. I wasn't in a mood to be terribly solicitous of Laura's wants and needs that morning. Before I left, I went down into the basement, opened a cabinet that seemed to be nothing more than a place for miscellaneous tools and flicked a switch that turned on a small piece of equipment that would record every landline phone conversation made from my house. A second switch activated a device that would intercept any cell phone calls made within a radius of 150 feet of the device's location. It wasn't strictly legal, but no one knew about it, and I'd never used the information captured by the equipment in any legal setting. Surveillance cameras already covered almost every room in the house. After I'd seen a documentary on a and &E, or discovery or something explaining how a murder had been solved with images found on a homeowner's interior spy cams, I had them installed all over my house. A secondary purpose was to monitor the movements and activities of any babysitters Laura and I brought into the house as well as the housekeeper who came in three times a week. We trusted the housekeeper and also the teenage girls we hired to watch our baby for a few hours on the nights on those occasions when Laura and I went out together. But trust but verify seemed a good policy to me. We hadn't, I reflected, had to hire a babysitter for too many months. I wasn't sure I was getting my money's worth from the expensive surveillance system. I pulled inside the tall chain link fence surrounding the new campus and around to the business office on the far side of the complex. The fence and the razor wire at the top had gone up when we got our first Department of Defense contract three years ago. After that, 
the DoD came back twice for additional small, but decidedly more profitable deals. I pulled into the wide, clearly marked parking slot and shut the engine off. I sat there, unmoving, while I tried to make a decision. My guts kept telling me Laura had some outside interest, but my brain countered, saying I had no actual proof. A racing pulse and a quick inhalation weren't enough to be sure. I'd seen a flash of guilt in her eyes, but she could be feeling bad about something else only vaguely connected with what I'd asked her. I hoped so anyway. The logo on the wall in front of my navigator was unexpectedly obscured, and it brought me out of my stupor. I lifted my chin in greeting to Phil Sanders, one of the first people I'd hired. Opening the door, I tossed him a quick, hello, and busied myself getting my Palm Pilot and briefcase from the rear seat. Instead of going inside immediately, I looked at the brilliantly colored logo. M.A. Industries. That's me, Mark Archer. At 34, I was CEO and president of a privately held little corporation that had started out as a small tool manufacturing company 12 years ago. We had found a niche making tilt and pan motor mounts for home security cameras. Working hard to sell ourselves, we found a number of private investigation companies who had a need for quality surveillance equipment. Over the years, we gradually built up a solid base of customers who came to trust us to provide high-quality, remotely controlled mounts. Eight years ago, we bought out a small company that made some excellent color cameras with an impressive optical zoom feature. The whole thing, including a powerful transmitter and separate receiver that could connect to an ordinary TV, was smaller than a woman's lipstick case. Now my little corporation had the whole package, and we began marketing our products all over the state and had plans to begin selling them on the internet. After that, we absorbed a couple of private investigation agencies and combined them into a division we named Information and Surveillance Associates. In a year, we had branch offices in three other cities. Overall, MA Industries was doing quite well, though we maintained a comfortably low profile. In my office, I signed the papers my secretary-slash-office manager put in front of me without bothering to review them. This was the routine activity stack, and they didn't really need my attention, but they did need my signature. I've gotten into the habit of teasing her by calling her Radar every so often and did so now. She always responded tartly with an admonition for Colonel Potter to pay attention to what he was doing. Maggie was the glue that kept our business office together. When she was on vacation, the place didn't run nearly as smoothly, and I dreaded the day she would come to tell me she was retiring. To stave off that day as long as possible, I paid her as well as each of the three company vice presidents. She knew that. They didn't. Maggie, I said when she brought me in the first mug of coffee for the day. Maggie, would you please have Carl Winters come see me? Sure, she replied promptly. She looked at me curiously. Can I say why? She asked. I shook my head but reconsidered almost immediately. I felt a need to say something in partial explanation. Maggie was a second mother to me and had been since we started out in a renovated warehouse back in the old days. Just tell him I need to become a customer of his, I said slowly, not looking at Maggie. She didn't say anything for a moment. Ah, oh, darn it all, she said softly. I'm so sorry, Mark. She sniffed softly, bit her lips, and left quickly. I stared after her, wondering what she knew or perhaps had divined. Carl headed up our Combined Surveillance and Private Investigations Division and Maggie had read something into my request to see him as a customer. That she had accepted my need without question was unsettling. What's up, Mark? Carl asked, coming in my office door. I motioned him to close the heavy oak door. I sat, looking at nothing in particular, while he took his first sip of tea from the big mug Maggie had brewing for him when he arrived. Carl, I started to explain, but I had to stop to clear my throat. It was hard to swallow. The tightness there was matched by stomach muscles so tense they hurt. Carl, I need. I'm afraid Laura is getting into something that she'll regret, I said slowly. I was trying to carefully choose my words, not wanting to tell him I suspected she was seeing a man behind my back. Ah, shit. Mark, he responded dejectedly. Damn, I'm sorry to hear that, he said. We both took a deep breath. Carl sat the mug on the corner of my desk and stared at his fingernails without speaking. I didn't know what to say either. Well, he said after an uncomfortable silence. Well, we've got everything we need to find out for sure. I can get a few temps to come in and replace some of our guys to free them up for a concentrated effort. Can you give me an idea of Laura's work schedule, her cell phone number, computer logins, credit card numbers, stuff like that? I nodded. 
I started to object to having in-house personnel work the case instead of bringing in outsiders for that purpose but quickly realized Carl wanted to have the best people possible working the issue. Sighing, I bent to the side of my desk and pulled my briefcase closer. I'd spent most of Sunday copying account numbers and some of the other information I knew he'd need from documents Laura and I had in our files. I had Carl set me up in the accounting as a paying customer of Information and Surveillance Associates. I'd pay that branch of my firm from my personal checking account. It was a little thing, but it would keep any auditors happy. We discussed ways and means of putting tails on my wife to see where she went, who she went with, and what they did when they got there. I felt guilty, and that was foolish. The hurt from this last weekend, combined with what I'd realized Friday night had been a steadily intensifying alienation from Laura's affection, made this a necessity. There were things I needed to know. Frankly, if Laura was doing nothing to harm the marriage, she'd never know what I was doing and maybe I'd find a way to suggest we go to a marriage counselor to resolve whatever issues she was laboring under. If she was doing something a married woman shouldn't do well, that was something I desperately needed to know. By noon, Carl's guys and gals had gotten into Laura's Lexus at the office building downtown where she worked. It wasn't difficult. My name was on the title too, so I gave them my key. They installed a sound-powered microphone under the driver's seat. The signal from the tiny transmitter could be heard anywhere within a one-mile radius. The mic itself was sensitive enough to pick up a soft whisper inside the well-soundproofed car. A GPS transmitter was put in a hidden corner of the trunk and began to immediately broadcast the vehicle's location accurate to within a few feet. Carl had seven of his best people working the case and had dedicated five vehicles to the project. All of the cars and vans were rentals he'd had gone over by our own in-house mechanics to ensure they wouldn't die when needed most. One additional girl, a freelancer with excellent credentials, applied for a job in Laura's accounting firm and expected to start the next week. Carl told me to sit back and let him take care of everything. There were operating procedures already in place to handle things like this, and it was best I stay out of it for the present. That depressed me even more. If Laura was cheating on our marriage, it was such a tawdry mundane thing that there already were standard procedures to deal with it. He also told me I had a choice. If they found out of an impending tryst, they could try to break it up if my purpose was to do so, or we could hold off and get quantities of pictures and video for a divorce trial. I opted for interrupting any assignation they found out about. I didn't have to think about it. I wanted my wife back. He nodded and asked me to try and not upset Laura and her routine. When we got to a decision point, he'd let me know. Instead. I let him know a cusp had already come and gone. That night, I called him from the basement after listening to the recordings from the cell phone intercept. The information so gathered wasn't legal, but we weren't expecting to use it in court. Carl answered on the second ring. Carl. I asked. My voice was thick with emotion, and he picked up on it immediately. Oh, geez, he said. What's happened? The concern he felt was evident. I took a deep breath and held it for a moment to get control of myself. You know the cell phone and landline intercepts I had you install when we built the house? I asked. Yeah. Uh, sorry we couldn't get over there today and set up the remote monitoring equipment, but... Oh, I know, Carl. There's only 26 hours in a day, right? Don't think anything about it. Anyway, Carl, I have a recorded conversation between Laura and some guy called Brian about 7 p.m. I drew in a ragged lungful of air and continued. You'll be able to hear it yourself tomorrow. I guess, but Brian talked of screwing Laura's brains out, again soon, to quote the son of a witch. I wanted to cry, but I wouldn't let the tears form. I couldn't stop the ball of ice from forming in the pit of my stomach. My body felt wooden, as if I were surrounded by massive layers of cotton that deadened every sensation. My chest hurt. I couldn't breath. Laura was having sex with some other guy, and I didn't know why. I couldn't think of any reason I'd given her for going outside the marriage for sex and I didn't know why she would betray me and our daughter this way. I tried to swallow the lump in my throat. Anyway, Carl, I said when I had enough control, that changes our focus. I'm going to call Pete tomorrow morning and start the process of divorcing Laura, so I guess what we need now is to get all the evidence we can find. Pete was Peter Robinson, a high-powered lawyer on retainer for MA Industries and also my personal attorney. Yeah, Mark. I guess there's not much else we can do, Carl said, his words slow and halting. Ah, oh, Mark, I'm just so sorry, he said. I don't have the words to tell you how sorry I am, he told me. His empathy helped some. Yeah, I know, Carl, I replied, my voice a little stronger. Thanks, partner, but it's on Laura's head. 
It's no one else's fault, but I have a little girl who's going to be devastated. She and I are the victims, and I don't understand why Laura did this. I focused my attention. I didn't want to play the long-suffering husband beyond this single maudlin moment. Okay, well, I just wanted you to know we'll be working in a different direction effective immediately, I told him. I'll see you in the office tomorrow morning, okay? Sure, Mark, he agreed. Hey, take it easy tonight, okay? Don't do anything you'll regret, boss, he said earnestly. I knew he was warning me not to do anything to physically harm my wife. I'm okay, Carl, I told him. I ran the tape on this intercept three hours ago, and I'm already way beyond that. I hesitated a moment. I will tell you, Carl, I won't be sleeping with her tonight or any other night. I'll have to figure out some excuse, but I won't sleep with a woman that stabs me in the back, figuratively or actually. There are things I can do and things I cannot do. I know it'll make the investigation harder, but I just can't. My voice cracked with the final words, but Carl didn't remark on it. That's okay, he said soothingly. It might take a little longer, Mark, but people who are doing these sort of things always think they're smarter than the rest of us. They're convinced they can keep their adultery hidden from their spouse, as well as the rest of the world, and they have no clue what they're doing is predictable and pretty easy to track. I didn't say anything. Well, you hang in there, boss, Carl told me. This will all come out okay, no matter how it gets taken care of. You hear me? You're going to come out the other side of this, stronger than you went in, okay? One way or the other, yeah, I will, I replied, but I didn't believe it. All I saw was a black hole full of suffering and humiliation ahead for me and my daughter. I hadn't even begun to consider all the heartache this was going to cause her. Okay, Mark, call me if you need me for anything, all right? Call me, even if it's just to talk, okay? I told him I would impress the off button on my cell phone. I turned the intercept equipment back on to catch any more communications between my dear wife and whoever it was she was screwing. I slept in a guest bedroom down the hall that night, telling Laura I had a dry throat and some congestion that might make me snore pretty badly. She agreed quickly and without comment. Besides, I told her, it would be closer to Alyssa if she might need one of us in the night. That our little girl had wet the bed a couple of times last week was news to Laura, but she shrugged her shoulders and went back to her magazine. What I recognized as an emotional problem our daughter was experiencing made no impression on Laura. Carl came to me with a preliminary report the next afternoon. Laura's sex buddy was Brian Collier, one of the accounting executives in the same office where Laura worked. He was one of three division supervisors, as was Laura. He was married and had a boy who was nine years old and a seven-year-old girl. His wife was Pamela, a part-time insurance agent in an office across town. Brian was 38 a little taller than I was but quite a bit slighter. I'd been an amateur boxer in the Golden Gloves organization in my early teens and had gotten into weightlifting to improve my upper body strength and leg stamina. I dropped the boxing when I went to college, but I still lifted a couple of times a week. Mr. Collier, as he appeared in the one photo Carl had found so far, was more of a runner, if he was an athlete at all. I didn't know what women considered handsome, but I guessed he might be good-looking to the ordinary female, but not exceptionally so. Overall, I wasn't terribly impressed. I wondered it was about him that would tempt Laura to disregard our wedding vows so flagrantly and meet this joker for sex. Carl had obtained a full two-year history of Laura's phone records, bribing a contact he had with the phone company, and some of his people had gone over them quickly. A first analysis showed that there were initially only a few phone calls between the two over widely separated occasions. A little less than six months ago, the calls had begun to be a weekly event and eventually a daily one. Now, they were occurring two or three times a day, usually at night or early in the morning. Carl knew what time I came into work, and he told me unequivocally the two were talking almost every morning after I left the house. The evening calls were almost always initiated by Laura and were undoubtedly made when Laura could be sure I would not overhear, probably when I was down in the basement lifting weights while my daughter kept me company. The timing was about right for my normal workout periods. Do you have anything you can tell me about what happened about the time the phone calls began to spike? Carl asked. He was being very businesslike about it all and I appreciated that. It made it marginally easier to deal with it from my end. I leaned back in my chair to think and even propped my feet up on the near corner of my desk. Seeing me relax a little, Carl did the same on the other side of the desk. Suddenly it came to me. Oh, well, maybe not. She went to a training seminar a couple of weeks before that in Chicago with a company that had hired her firm to audit their financial records, I said uncertainly. 
I was remembering more as I thought about it. You know, I said. I stopped while a fragment of a memory coalesced into something I could see in my mind. I took Laura to the airport for that, I said slowly, and this guy was there too, getting on the same plane. I can remember it clear as a bell. Okay, Carl said confidently. I'll have my folks keep on looking for another nexus, but I think we'll find that that seminar was the beginning of this whole mess. Too many things are pointing toward it. I nodded. I'm not a man who believes in coincidences either. Carl checked his notepad. That's it for now, boss, he said. We got the credit card issuers to email us digital copies of all the activity for the past year. It helps that you and Laura have joint accounts on all of them. Oh, that reminds me. We'll be looking at your bank records later today also, to see if there's anything there. I'll let you know what we find out, okay? I was impressed by the volume and depth of information that had already been accumulated. They'd only been working on the case for parts of two days. How did you get all that without my authorization? I asked. I wondered if I really shouldn't pitch a fit with the banks and phone companies about releasing private information so easily. Carl grinned. You authorized all of it, he said. I let my eyebrows rise questioningly. He chuckled. Boss, you got no idea what you're signing when Maggie puts a stack of paperwork in front of you, huh? I had to smile and nod. The grin dropped from my face. I used to say I trusted Maggie almost as much as I did my wife. Now Maggie had the top slot. Okay, okay, I said, raising my hands in surrender. Go forth and do battle with the bad guys and girls, I told him. By Thursday, Carl and his team had accumulated a massive pile of information about my wife and her new sex partner. Two investigators had been dispatched to Chicago, and they'd already turned up a half dozen people at the company hosting the seminars who remembered Laura and Brian as being very close. One of the desk clerks, a witness to most of their hijinks, had thought they were married to each other before he noticed their different surnames. Another three or four people at the hotel where Laura and Brian stayed recalled them as frequent visitors to the lounge where they imbibed considerable quantities of liquor. Apparently, they would stumble to the elevator and up to one room or the other in the early hours of the morning. The lounge manager had had to ask them to tone down their risque behavior on two occasions. Carl's two investigators said they were negotiating with the hotel management to see if the security camera tapes from that period were still available and whether they might be obtained for a reasonable fee. Carl told me with a grin that was a euphemism for an under-the-table transfer of tapes for greenbacks. I nodded. I'd understood that from his tone of voice. His freelance operative had been called in for a temporary assignment in Laura's office much earlier than expected and she was already reporting that Brian and Laura were an item around the office. Apparently, their mutual boss knew about it too, and he'd admonished them several times to keep their affair out of the workplace. Laura, it was said, had already lost a merit increase on her salary because of a poor performance report based on her conduct. I marked that in my memory. My attorney would be interested in hearing of a firm that didn't do much of anything to stop clear violations of the morals clauses written into their employees' contracts. The freelancer was working in the payroll section and had already obtained copies of Laura and Mr. Collier's pay records, along with time and attendance information. It appeared the dynamic duo was taking off one or two afternoons a week for a rendezvous. Credit card data Carl obtained from our bank showed where. It seemed Brian Collier was a cheapskate too because Laura paid for most of the rooms at an economy motel on the outskirts of town. To me, that signified what a cheap, tasteless little affair this was. They couldn't even get together in a decent downtown hotel. The little group of girlfriends that Laura said she was meeting when she went out at night was composed primarily of single and recently divorced women obviously on the prowl for men. Laura had sworn them to secrecy, but all of them except for a woman by the name of Kathy were talking fast and giving lots of details to Carl's investigators. A hundred dollars was all it took for most of them to give dates, places, and even approximate times when Laura and Brian would hook up as if by accident. Lately, even that fiction had been discarded. Most of the girls hadn't seen Laura in two months. Kathy called Laura almost immediately and told her about being questioned by a strange man about Laura's involvement with the group. She maintained to Laura that she hadn't spilled the beans even a little bit. Kathy was fit to be tied. She thought it was unreasonable, spiteful, and mean for me to be checking up on her good friend Laura. She was right when she assumed it was me. I was the logical person to suspect, of course. Kathy had plenty of experience in such matters. A still incomplete background check on Kathy showed she had been divorced twice, once because she caught her husband screwing his secretary and the second time because her new husband caught her with the plumber. 
For the past few years, Kathy had wandered from man to man. On two occasions, she was named as a correspondent in divorce cases where she went out of her way to seduce the husbands. Somehow, this woman had gotten into the same group as my wife in spite of the fact she didn't even work in the same business building as the others. It seemed Kathy was, at least to some extent, encouraging the affair simply because she could. We also knew that, so far, the $100 bribes were holding with the other women because Carl had cloned Laura's cell phone. The other girls responded to Laura's panicked calls with assurances much like Kathy had given her. That they would actually give her up never occurred to Laura. So, all Laura actually knew was that someone was asking questions but all of her friends were protecting her secret, she thought. I was again astonished at the quantity and quality of the information Carl's operation had developed in so short a time. Of course, Brian and Laura were rank amateurs and Carl was the quintessential professional. Brian and Laura didn't have a chance. The rest of that week and the next two were quiet around our home. Laura had canceled all but Friday's night out on the town and Carl's agents confirmed the ladies went out to a couple of clubs and danced a while with pretty much anyone who asked. Everyone went straight home afterward. Brian was a good little boy and stayed home with his wife and children. I read a report that suggested Brian's wife wasn't all that thrilled to have him home and she'd been very vocal while wondering about his sudden change of habit. I was surprised the effect of the investigators questioning the girls in the little group was so short, but I guess there had to be an element of arrogance in Laura and Brian's attitude toward me. After all, they'd been going strong for so long. Whatever it was, barely three weeks after the investigators contacted the Friday night partiers, cell phone intercepts began to become more numerous and more explicit. The pair of cheating spouses had decided everything had blown over and they decided that I had concluded there was nothing going on. During this period, I'd almost moved completely into the spare bedroom. I could barely stand to kiss Laura on the cheek when I came home in the evening and there was no way I was going to have sex with her. She hinted several times that she was amenable to some hot sex, but I ignored her. I read Alyssa every book in her little library and I bought more to go through with her. After I perfected a harsh-sounding, dry cough, Laura didn't question why I was sleeping away from her. Laura never suggested that I shouldn't be around the baby with a cough like that though. Anyway, Carl and his crew noted the cell phone conversations between the two late at night had increased dramatically. On Wednesday of the third week, Laura and Brian arranged to meet at their normal cheap motel. Carl had everyone chopping at the bit to get the goods on the adulterers and Pete, my attorney, had me primed and ready as how to act. I had Mandy, a 16-year-old girl from down the street ready to babysit Alyssa that night. Laura, I said, please don't go out tonight. I was standing in the living room as she was walking out the door. Please, Laura, I pleaded. I wasn't play-acting. I really didn't want her to meet that son of a witch out there and beat him. Mark. Laura snapped at me. Realizing she couldn't leave with me without attempting to placate me, her face softened. Look, nothing is going on, Mark. I'm just going out for a few drinks and maybe a little dancing. That's all, she said with a butter wouldn't melt in my mouth expression. She came back to hug me and earnestly look me in the eyes, trying to convince me I was wrong about something I knew for a fact she was going to do. Laura, I said impulsively. I know you're meeting someone tonight, but you can't possibly mean as much to him as you do to Alyssa and me. Please, baby, don't go. Laura pulled back and released me. She was suddenly suspicious. She wondered what I knew. What the hell are you talking about? She asked indignantly. I had to give it to her. She had developed into a fine actress. I just know, I insisted. I know you're cheating on me with someone. You're cheating on me and you're cheating on Alyssa, and it's not fair to either one of us, I protested. She relaxed a trifle. Her reasoning was clearly that if I didn't blurt out a name, all I had was suspicions. I am not cheating on you, she said firmly. I'm getting a little tired of all these accusations and it's about time to stop, she admonished me. You keep it up, damn you, and I might just go get some strange man to take care of my needs to show you. I had to look away. I'd have blown everything if she'd seen the sudden rage in my eyes. Laura, I said brokenly. It wasn't difficult. The fury I was feeling was making it hard for me to speak. Not another goddamn word, she said forcefully. I have never, I am not now, and I never will screw another man other than you. There. Does that satisfy you? Angrily, she turned and walked to the door, pulling on a light jacket over her shoulders. I could see she wasn't wearing a bra, and I couldn't see any panty lines on her miniskirt. Laura, I said a little more calmly. If you ever cheat on me, that ends the marriage. You know that, right? We talked about cheating 
and what it does to marriages when Georgia and Sam broke up last year. Remember? For a moment, Laura's hand didn't move on the doorknob. I told you, she said. Her voice was controlled, but I detected a condescending note in it. I swear to you, I don't want any man but you. And I never will, she said. Now I'm late and I've got to go, she said firmly. Without even looking back at me, she opened the door and left. Twenty minutes later, I joined Carl and three of his best in the room next to where Brian and Laura would soon be. A little spooked by my protest this evening as well as the suspicious questioning of Laura's girlfriends in weeks past, Brian and Laura were apparently driving around at random, trying to see if anyone was following them. The GPS devices told us that. Actually, there was no one behind either of them. Carl had known of the reservation at the motel a minute or two after it was made because the desk clerk had been paid a couple hundred dollars to call when it happened. Since we knew where they'd wind up, there was no reason to track them. It could have been done, though. If we hadn't known their destination, Carl would have used half a dozen cars to keep pace on parallel streets with Laura and her friend. With the GPS instruments installed in both of their cars, neither of the two would ever have seen their followers. After I'd been there a short time, Laura and Brian drove up almost simultaneously to the motel in their cars and parked in front of room 113. The motel had exterior entrances to all the rooms and the pair of lovers had only to get out of their vehicles and walk a couple of paces to the door. Neither of them noticed the dark van across the street. They had no idea a high-end digital camera was taping their every move. Laura and Brian wrapped their arms around each other and kissed each other deeply while rubbing their bodies all over each other. Carl was watching me closely. He knew I wanted nothing more than to burst out the door and start wrecking havoc. Mark, he said quietly. It's going to get a lot worse before it's over. Are you sure you can stand this? I sat back down on one of the double beds and licked suddenly dry lips. Do you have anything to drink? I asked. He misunderstood and shook his head. No, but I think you should take this Valium, he said, offering me a tiny yellow tablet. It'll help calm your nerves, he said gently. I accepted it and then got a soft drink from the cooler that he had, in fact, brought with him. Carl had managed to get one high-end digital camera into the room, hiding it in the air conditioning vent. It was full color, had a full range of motion through an arc of 160 degrees from side to side and 85 degrees up and down. On top of that, it had a 25x zoom that would isolate one hair in the nostrils of any one of these two. Not that Carl expected any need for that kind of detail. Once the duo went inside, the action started almost immediately. Laura had not worn any bra or panties, as I had suspected, and was out of her dress in seconds. Brian wasn't far behind. When they fell on the bed, we turned all the lights in our room off, and two of Carl's men went out into the night. In addition to the camera and the air conditioning vent, Carl had brought two fiber-optic snake cameras with him. One was slipped under the door to Laura's room and the other over the top of the door. The cameras were less than a quarter inch in diameter and just a couple inches long. They slid easily through the gaps between door and frame, leaving the transmitter and antenna outside. Once the cameras were positioned where the men wanted them, they taped the transmitters to the outside wall. In the darkness, the dark-colored spy devices were undetectable from more than a couple feet away. To enhance this, the guys unscrewed the only outside light close enough to illuminate the area before they came back inside. The receivers were already plugged into the monitors and recording equipment, and we settled back for the show. The theory was that what one camera missed, the other two would certainly catch. It wasn't much of a show, actually. There was no foreplay, no tenderness, and no affection at all. Brian just slipped on a yellowish-colored condom, mounted my 304 of a wife in the missionary position, and proceeded to drill away. I watched her face closely for a moment. I wasn't sure if it was pain or ecstasy causing the wrinkles on her forehead. Damn, I said after watching for a minute or two, that SB isn't any bigger than me. Hell, he isn't anywhere near as big as I am. I protested. What the hell? It was true. Laura had been in a heat to measure me when we first got married and had used a ruler on me a number of times. Laura figured out from her girlfriends that my size was on the high end of average. She began calling out to me, demanding to be drilled by my big toll, when we made love. We hadn't done any of that lately. I guessed I knew why, but then again, I really didn't. Brian was obviously near the low end of average, and he had to work hard to give Laura any kind of stimulation. Not only that, the creep had the technique of a hog rutting in a barnyard. What the hell was Laura going to this guy for? My pride was partially redeemed a little later happily. I caught Sherry, one of Carl's agents, looking at my crotch a little while later. 
She glanced up at the TV monitors and shook her head. She smiled I thought I detected a little speculation in her eyes. We both looked away. She worked for me and I wasn't about to mess around in my own backyard, as they say. She was cute, though. Maybe she wouldn't always work for me. There was an opening coming up for a bedmate soon. After a while, I left. There was nothing more to see. Brian and Laura would go at it for a time, rest, and do it again. Just what did Laura see in this bozo, and why was she throwing away six years of marriage to have sex with him? The two adulterers didn't meet for a week, and they were both more than a little upset with a world that kept them apart. It seemed their schedules just weren't meshing very well, for a change, and they didn't know what to do about it. One day, Kathy came to Laura with a proposal that she and Laura go to Las Vegas for the next weekend. The investigating crew had an extensive dossier on Kathy now. They'd found a mountain of information about her. Kathy, it appeared, was an extremely spiteful woman. Friends knew her as bitter and alienated from her parents and siblings by earlier infidelities. In a phone call neither knew was monitored by Carl's crew, Kathy expanded on her earlier suggestion. She wanted Laura to tell me that Kathy had won two free tickets to Vegas in a call-in contest on the radio and had invited Laura to go along. It was clear to everyone hearing the tape of the phone call that Kathy was proposing that only she and Laura take a trip to Sin City. Simply put, the purpose was to get laid as often as possible. She told Laura she'd bought two dozen condoms and intended to use every one of them. Laura was won over quickly, but she threw a monkey wrench into Kathy's plans by immediately calling Brian and inviting him along. Kathy sounded unhappy to hear Brian would be joining them there when she heard about it in a later phone call. She made no protest though. I gathered Brian had to pay his own way. He didn't seem to appreciate that much, judging by the snippy nature of his last phone call before departing. I couldn't help but think what a cheap man he was. He actually thought Laura should pay for his trip out there so he could screw her. Incredible! Pete, my lawyer, told me he was adding Kathy to his list of people to serve with subpoenas. She was well aware, and had been for a long time, that both Laura and Brian were married. By enticing Laura to spend the weekend in Vegas, she was acting as a facilitator in the whole nasty mess. Pete didn't think she had any money he could get out of her. He didn't even think the lawsuit would go very far in the civil courts but he was going to put the fear of God into her, he said. She would never, never ever, consider helping wreck anyone else's marriage when he was through with her. We discussed whether to stop this thing with just the footage from the motel or wait until the planned Vegas trip. I was inclined to end the intrigue, the lying, and the deceit right now and just initiate divorce proceedings on Laura immediately. Pete thought we should give them a little more rope to hang themselves, as he put it. The trip outside the state with all the attendant lies and misrepresentations, would seal their fate. The impact would be especially strong if Laura showed a particularly egregious lack of respect for her marriage vows. Lawyers talk funny. What he really wanted was to see her way over the line in word or deed. As it happened, he got both. The investigators were in the same casino hotel where Kathy, Brian, and Laura were staying. They were in one of the two towers while Carl and five of his minions were in a room in the other tower where there was a direct line of sight down into the cheating trio's room. It had cost us $500 for the room clerk to assign Laura a room on this side of the building and one that could easily be viewed from where Carl was. Carl's operative said those five bills disappeared off the counter faster than the eye could follow. A few seconds work on the reservation computer console was all the clerk had to do. He probably thought it was the easiest money he'd ever earned in his life. Only a couple of hundred feet away Laura's room, the three cameras Carl had set up to tape activity in the room across the way were ready. He told me there was a good chance they would have something to record. According to studies he'd seen, people in high-rise buildings instinctively feel their height and apparent distance from other structures give them a high degree of invisibility. That had been borne out in a number of the cases he'd handled, he said. Even if they closed the shades, Carl's boys had a laser-based device that would be able to sense the minute vibrations of the window over there of the sounds made by the trio of partiers over there. We'd only have a recording of their voices no video, but it would be of high enough quality to be able to prove in court who the speakers were. It was, Carl said, something that had been perfected during the Cold War and used by Russians and Western intelligence agencies to spy on each other. The telephone conversation was also going to be taped, of course. I was to call Laura and make one last attempt on my part to get Laura to renounce her cheating ways and come home to me. From my attorney's point of view, it was only a prepared script, but I was hoping against hope that it might succeed. I could feel hot flushes and freezing chills chasing each other madly about my body. 
Conflicting emotions chased themselves around my mind in much the same fashion. I didn't know what I was feeling, except that I hurt. I was sick at my stomach, though I hadn't eaten anything the whole day. Carl and his people left me at home, but I had a great view by way of the cameras they'd set up. A detective following them had watched them almost wear out a stewardess on the plane bringing them little bottles of booze. They were three sheets to the wind already. Laura, I said into the cell phone. On the webcam, I could see Laura was on her knees and elbows on the bed being screwed by Brian standing behind her. She'd had to contort her body and stretch around to reach the phone on the nightstand. Kathy was standing behind Brian and enjoying. What? She said sharply into her cell phone. She moved away from Brian and Kathy away when she heard my voice. Laura, I said again, please, honey, don't have sex with be that, man. I'd almost slipped and said the guy's name. I'd have to watch it. I wasn't supposed to know his name yet. I couldn't let Laura know her every move was being covertly watched. Come home to me, babe, please, I pleaded. We can work something out. I tried to sound as coaxing as I could possibly be. This was the wording my attorney wanted me to use. It was designed to show Laura's complete unfaithfulness and indifference. Laura, please, think of Alyssa. Think of what ruining our marriage will do to her. It's amazing how long a man will hold out hope, even when he's seeing something beautiful shattered before his eyes. I loved Laura. I hoped I could see something to give me hope, but there really wasn't any hope. I might love her. I hadn't learned how not to just yet, but I sure didn't like her at all just at this moment. She affirmed that dislike almost immediately. Screw you. Laura screamed into the phone. I've told you before, you stupid shit. I am not having sex with anyone and I've had it with your damn suspicions. I could only shake my head at the duplicity. How in the hell could she say that while she stood naked beside the man who had been screwing her and would be again when I hung up? I was amazed at the duplicity she was quiet for a moment. On TV, I could see she had moved closer to her friends and was watching them go down on each other. But I'll tell you this, sweetheart, she said finally in a confiding tone. I just might go pick up some a-hole down on the drag tonight and bring him up to my room tonight. How's that? Honey, would you like that? After all, I'll be doing it just so you can be right for once. How would that be? Dear, I was astounded by the vindictiveness in her voice. This was the same woman who only a year ago wanted to be held all night long after a favorite aunt passed away. I knew Laura as a soft, comfortable presence in my bed the person to whom I could turn with any problem and a willing lover when our baby was asleep. Laura, I said unsteadily. I don't know what else to say. I don't know why you want to screw around with our lives like this. Think of what you're going to do to Alyssa for God's sake. I... Laura cut me off with another shrill scream. You go to hell and take her with you, Laura shouted. She was almost incoherent. It was only because I could see her lips on the monitor screen that I could understand what she was yelling. When I get home, you son of a witch, we're gonna have this out, damn you, and you're going to be lucky if I don't leave your sorry bum. You got that, you. She screeched some more things I couldn't understand even with the advantage of being able to watch her lips move. She stabbed at the off button and threw the cell phone at the bed. It bounced off and landed somewhere between the bed and the wall. She staggered over to the bed and motioned to Brian to get back in position. Sunday morning, Carl and the crew dismantled the operation, packed up all the equipment, and shipped it home. Exhausted, they got on a plane and slept all the way home. We literally had more information in the form of videotape, pictures, phone transcripts, and financial analysis than my attorney could handle. The sheer volume overwhelmed Pete for a time. He'd be filing the divorce proceedings just before noon on Monday. After that, he'd have six months, give or take, to go through the massive material before the state would rubber stamp the obvious and give me my divorce. One thing we could use immediately was the vivid video of my wife being drilled by a strange man while screaming curses directed me and our daughter after assuring me seconds before that she would never do such a thing. That had been obtained by video taping them through an open window. What a naked eye could observe could also be recorded for evidence. To that we added footage from my home surveillance cameras showing a montage of incidents where Laura could be heard and seen doing something to show indifference to Alyssa's welfare. One example of that was the scene at the door the night Laura went out and Alyssa came running down the stairs to catch her. Other snippets showed Laura being short with the child for no reason, and one showed her telling Alyssa she could get her own breakfast because she, Laura, didn't have time. All of that was bundled together and put before a judge early Monday morning. She was moved to grant a temporary restraining order granting me full custodial privileges pending action by the family court system. 
Another one granted our request to keep Laura away from the child until a family court judge had time to review the case. There were several other motions that were granted almost without question. It's wonderful what a wealthy and influential man can get done in a short period. Actually, I was helping that man, my attorney, become even wealthier. Monday morning was never a good time in the accounting firm. There were more than a few hard drinkers among the staff, and, of those, some had begun partying Friday night and hadn't quit until Sunday evening. Most of the other personnel dawdled at their desks or visited with others around the coffee machine until the drinkers got themselves in hand. When the big man dressed in a gray suit came in from the common area hallway just after the lunch hour, a few hopeful women marked his progress down the aisles, but he seemed to have no interest. He kept glancing at a photograph in his right hand while looking every woman directly in the face. After a few moments' search, he found the woman he was looking for. He planted himself in front of her as she spoke quietly to a tall, distinguished-looking man in his early forties and a shorter, slider man who was clinging close to the woman. She wasn't very happy about that and kept trying to slide away from him. Her eyes were dark and troubled. She was forcing herself to pay attention to what her supervisor was saying. Laura Archer? The big man asked in a deep, rumbling voice. He'd come up behind the three without them noticing. The woman turned and nodded. She was not happy today. Something was haunting her, and it showed on her face. She watched as the man took a thick envelope from his inside coat pocket. You, madam, he said in a booming voice, are served. He paused for effect, making sure he had everyone's attention. He set his briefcase down on a convenient desk and began taking out legal documents printed on onion skin and backed with a thicker baby blue sheet of paper. This, he told a stunned Laura, is a copy of the petition for divorce filed this morning. It is Mr. Mark Archer's intent to divorce you at the earliest possible moment. He handed her another set of papers. This, madam, is an order from the court that you not come within 1,000 feet of the residence formerly occupied by you and Mr. Archer. He dropped another set of documents into her hands. This is a temporary restraining order forbidding you to contact Mr. Archer's daughter, one Alyssa Rio Archer, for any reason. You may not place a phone call, send an email, a letter, or any other manner attempt to speak to Miss Archer. Is that clear, madam? He asked. Laura nodded numbly. She didn't know what else to do. The look of horror on her face was plain to everyone. By now a large crowd was gathering and coming nearer. Mr. Archer, the big man continued, wishes that you be informed all of your joint account credit cards were canceled two hours ago. Your joint checking and savings accounts you held with your former husband have also been closed. This represents 50% of the total amount in the former joint accounts. He disdainfully held up a cashier's check by one corner, as if it were contaminated with some nasty substance, before adding it to the stack of paperwork in Laura Archer's hands. Mr. Archer further wishes me to inform you that all of your clothing and personal possessions are being packed at this moment and will be loaded into a truck now arriving at your former residence. All of your personal goods will be placed in storage and will be made available to you whenever and wherever you desire. You may communicate your wishes to Mr. Archer's attorney at the number shown on this card. You will not be allowed inside the residence you formerly shared with Mr. Archer for any reason, and he wishes me to advise you the locks have all been replaced and the security codes changed in the residence's security system. The big man looked down at the now crying woman with no sign of pity. He looked around, spying the slender man trying to slip away without notice. Mr. Collier, he boomed. Don't be in such a hurry. Taking another envelope from his briefcase, he slapped it into Brian Collier's unwilling palm. You, sir, are served, remarked the big man. Congratulations, he said. You were named as a correspondent in the matter of Archer versus Archer. And he took another mass of stapled papers from the briefcase. You also are the respondent in a civil case filed this morning by Mr. Archer for willfully and maliciously interfering in the marriage between Mark Archer and Laura Archer and that you have been carrying on a slimy, ugly. Sorted little affair with the former Mrs. Archer. Brian looked like he was about to faint and had to hold on to a desk to keep from falling. My attorney didn't think this. The big man looked around. Seeing Laura's supervisor, he made his way to him to serve him with notice of a suit also filed this morning demanding reimbursement to Mark Archer for failing to enforce the company's morality clauses with all the contracts for mid-level and above employees. A senior vice president, Aware of the problem from the start was also served in the executive offices. Watching from the back of the room, I felt almost nothing. I was cold, my face frozen into harsh, unforgiving planes. I stood silently near the doors through which the process server had entered. I'd paid him a healthy extra fee to give my wife the check and other stuff. 
It wasn't his job, strictly speaking. I saw dawning realization of how thoroughly she'd screwed herself spread across Laura's pretty face. When she collapsed on the floor, I turned and left through the big double-wide doors. I watched my soon-to-be ex-wife make her way into the dark panel conference room. I was seated at the head of the long table near the windows. The bright sunshine kept my face in shadow, and she had to squint to make sure it was me. I sat in a big executive chair, leaning back and affecting a relaxation I didn't truly feel. I knew I masked it well. I practiced often enough. I wanted to see you before all the lawyers got at me, Laura said hesitantly. She pulled out a chair a few paces away and sat down. It had been nearly four months since she'd lost her job and gone home to live with her brother. Her brunette hair was almost shoulder length again. She'd cut it when she'd gone to work for the accounting company, thinking it looked smarter and projected an image of the professional woman. She was thinner and didn't move very well. She looked like she hadn't been eating or sleeping well. There were dark circles under her eyes. My heart went out to her, but I refused to let any of that show. In something this intensely personal, I was wearing my corporate CEO face, something I usually showed only to subordinates and business associates. It was often an implacably ruthless one. And now you are here, I said quietly to my wife. She nodded, looking anywhere but at me. Finally, she couldn't do anything except face me directly. Mark. She said softly, I want to start by saying I am so sorry for what I've done to you and to my baby girl. I didn't say anything. I know that isn't. It isn't adequate, and it doesn't begin to make up for all the hurt I've put you through, but they're the only words I have, she whispered. I'm suffering too, Mark, she said. I cannot figure out why I did what I did, and it's driving me crazy. She didn't add anything more for a long while, so I filled the silence with a comment. I beg to differ, I said matter-of-factly. You haven't begun to suffer, Laura, until you have to tell a three-year-old child that her mother might never come home to be with her. Laura broke down and began sobbing quietly. It's been four months since I had to tell her that, Laura, and she still cries herself to sleep most nights. It's only in the last few weeks that I've been able to coax a smile out of her once in a while. I paused and watched Laura double over in her chair as she cried. She screams and attacks anyone trying to hold her back from getting to me if I have to leave her somewhere for an unexpectedly long time, I said quietly. She's terrified someday I won't come back to get her. Can you imagine what that fear must be like to a little girl not quite four years old, Laura? Can you? I forced myself to settle back in my seat while Laura shuddered through another set of racking sobs. She's in a new daycare center here at the corporate campus, I told her. I had to build one so I'd never be more than a few minutes away. Any more than that, and she goes into hysterics when she can't get to me. I watched Laura cry for a while longer. But, on the good side, I said a lot more cheerfully than I felt. Productivity is way up among the single parents who work here, and it's almost already paid for itself. It made no impression on her. I let the silence build. Why? I asked as gently as I could. Why'd you do it? Laura? I loved you more than life itself. And you ripped the soul right out of me. There's a big empty place inside me now. Laura. And I can't even begin to fill it until I know why you did this. Thing. She only shook her head and let a river of tears flow down her cheeks. I saw she hadn't worn any makeup. She would probably anticipated the tears. She was still beautiful perhaps more beautiful as a mature 30-year-old woman than the girl I'd married. My heart was breaking as I watched her cry. I wanted to give in and cry too. I lost a younger brother in an automobile accident when I was a teenager. I was more miserable today than I was at that time, and I didn't know how to fix things any more than I had then. I didn't know if the ache inside me would ever heal this time. I don't know why, she said after a long time. I think I might be insane or something. She was quiet. I can't undo what I've done. Mark, she said softly. I don't deserve your forgiveness and I won't ask for it, she whispered. I've hurt the only man I can ever love so terribly bad. I'll have to bear the pain of that for the rest of my life and I don't know what to do about it. I want to die when I look back over what all I've done to my sweet baby girl. When I listen to myself, replaying that night in my head and listening to me scream at you to take her to hell with you. She broke off and put her head back to stare unseeing at the ceiling. The tears flowed in a steady stream. I almost used the remote beside my hand to bring up the DVD player in the corner. Without referring to the list of bookmarks on the disc, I knew which one was the scene of this woman, naked and drunk, damning her own daughter to hell. It seemed hardly necessary, so I didn't. She apparently knew it well enough already. After a while, her tears slowed and stopped. I thought she was probably too dehydrated to cry anymore. I put the remote control in an upper drawer of the nearby credenza. 
I'm seeing a counselor, a psychologist, she said slowly. I'm trying to find out why I destroyed our lives so completely and hurt so many other people too. Her fingers were twining around each other like so many serpents. I want to see Stacy Collier, she ventured. I apologized for doing what I've done to her family. She was nice to me, Laura mused. I don't know why. She stared at the grain in the heavy tabletop directly in front of her for a time. Stacy told me Brian usually managed to find some woman wherever he worked. She said she got used to it, but this time she's had enough. She's divorcing Brian and she's already moving on. She's found a good man interested who loves her children and she says he's the best thing that ever happened to her. I had known Stacy Collier was divorcing her husband and I knew about the new man in her life. I hadn't been aware Laura had gone to Stacy and apologized. That she'd done that implied remorse and a willingness to accept the responsibility for the things she'd done. Something deep inside me stirred. Something hopeful peeked out, wondering if there was a chance it could live and grow. What is the doctor telling you? I asked. Laura glanced at me and quickly back to the surface of the table. We haven't made any progress, she admitted. I'd give anything to tell you we had, but all I know now is that something happened when I got to drinking so heavy there for a while. It. Were you drugged? Laura, I said, interrupting whatever she'd been about to say. She looked up at me and held my eyes with hers for the first time. I couldn't read the play of emotions that chased each other across her face. I don't know, she finally admitted. Maybe the first time. I. Maybe the first time I had. Dot. She stopped, swallowing hard. The first time I had. Sex with Brian. I know I was awfully drunk. Her head dropped again. But I wasn't drugged. Sometimes I wasn't even drunk. After that, she said. Her sobs began again, and she visibly choked them off. I wish I had that excuse, she said softly. But I don't. I'm trying to find out what the real reasons are with my counselor. She stopped talking for a while, resuming only when I shifted my weight in the chair. Mark. I lifted my chin and raised my eyebrows in question. Would you go see her? She wants to talk to you, but not what you think. She just wants to ask you some questions. She wants to ask some questions and see if she can find anything I haven't been able to tell her. She. Laura's words tumbled over each other in a rushing stream. She was trying to get everything in before I started yelling, I suppose. When? I said simply. Laura stared at me disbelievingly. You'll go, she asked with her voice full of emotion. I shrugged. I'm still your husband, I told her somberly. I'll do what I can to help you so long as it doesn't harm, our child. I'd almost said my child, but I didn't. A sudden hope blossomed in her eyes and grew stronger. I started to say something cutting to make her realize there was no real chance, but I stopped. I was willing to explore just about any avenue that would be in my little girl's best interests. I had loved Laura without reservation. I still loved her. Love isn't something one turns on and off like a spigot. Conversely, love couldn't conquer the sense of deep betrayal I felt either. We were on our way for a divorce, and that is what fate had planned for us. It took six months, and it was finally over. I did not stop my ex-wife from visiting my daughter not during the divorce and not after it. Laura tried multiple times to reconcile, but it was not what I wanted. The ordeal was way too much for me, and I had to get into counseling. It did help me a lot. I reduced my working hours so as to be with my daughter. A year later, Laura left town and married an accountant. My daughter was part of the marriage. I was invited but decided not to be part of it. I never married again and dedicated my life only for my daughter. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.